everyone for being here. My name is Meher O'Brien. I'm the head of creative um, here in Arbor, New York. Welcome to our space if it's your first time. Welcome back if you haven't been here since the launch party at the end of January 2020, just before COVID family. Oh <laughs> We're really excited to have events again. We had one last summer, but it was pretty COVID contained, so uh, with a much smaller audience. We do have another event coming up for Design Week in about a month. It will also involve AI and karaoke. That's all I'm here to say. It will be fun. Please come. Um, but uh, I'll keep this introduction short. AI is kind of what everybody is talking about now. You can't listen to the news or follow any social media. Uh, or be in a business meeting without AI coming up in the conversation. However, um, we at Argo have been talking about it actually for many, many years. So I'm um, absolutely thrilled that Mark, the founder of Argo uh, and our global chief creative director, my boss and mentor and friend, I love this guy, um, could join us from Austin along with Matthew Santone, one of our principal designers, our original principal designer in Austin, and New York's very own program director, Kirsten Gray, for an evening on human centered design uh, for AI in business. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, okay, so this topic's like 15 minutes old, right? And I'm sure you guys have seen some other talks about it. and. We hope to add to that conversation, and we hope also we get to a point in this where all of you can contribute and um, either through questions or your own ideas. I'm uh, sitting here talking to Dom quite a bit about it, and it's very exciting because he's knee, bit, knee deep in it as well. Uh, I'm sure many of you are. For Argo Design, our very first customer in 2014, uh, the very first paycheck we got was from an AI company who remained our customer until they got bought up by another company, as, as they do. Uh, and we have worked industrially in this topic uh, for nearly the last 10 years. It's been a big part of us, so hopefully this doesn't just come across as jumping on the bandwagon, but something that's been very near and dear to us. Uh, a lot of our work has been in what I'd call low-code solutioning for AI. It's given us a lens on the subject but also a lens on how this is impacting just the larger industrial role of design. And I say industrial role is in contributing towards business purpose, but it's also given us a lens on the humanistic implications of the technology. And I don't terribly want us to get too lost in that, but you can't talk about design for anything that matters to people without talking about what's that mean to them. And I do think this is one of those subjects that is not benign. It's probably the least benign thing to come along uh, in many years. And all of us probably spend most of our time talking about that side of it. So to start with, we've kind of got a two-parter here. Matthew's going to walk through a wonderful presentation to show where we have, in a lab context, taken it and applied which is generative AI, just to separate, there is sort of industrial, reductive, problem-solving AI, uh, probabilistic reasoning versus a generative uh, style of AI, like GPT-3, 5, and 4. And we've taken the generative part and used it on some design projects. In other words, real rolling projects with real rolling implications. We called it a lab instance in the sense that we were writing shotgun and not just handing over responsibilities. But it'll give you, I think, a really nice starting framework for those of you already need deep in it, we'll just level set. For those of you who aren't, it, it should be quite interesting. And then we'll kind of move to some larger thinking around the implications and where we feel like, given what I just described as our experience, where we feel like it's going. And then hopefully just open that up. So hopefully that's useful to you. We want to keep the conversation both focused on kind of in some industrial application, but not exclusively focused on what it means as people, as you know, those two things are largely inseparable. Matthew, please. I'm doing a little controller. I'm not texting while I'm talking. <laughs> um, so this talk actually I gave a flavor of it internally in Argo is sort of a 
holy shit, this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, this is what we were doing sort of behind the scenes in this lab environment. Um, and just a quick level set, I just wanted to give you a peek of uh, I, well, designer Argo. I'm not a programmer or anything, so I'll just give you that sort of level set. So flying here to uh, New York from Austin, and you know now I can get high speed internet on the flight and it's free through Delta. It's like 30 megs down. It's pretty awesome. So I'm streaming music on Tidal, you know, and I have BART pulled up because it's just, you know, Google just released this. They're saying it's great at coding all of that. Uh, and I already had a coding experiment going on where I'm trying to uh, take a, a client of ours and do some real time sort of graphing with it. It's just stuff I've never been able to approach before, but I'm sort of just trying it out. Um, Mart is actually not very good at this right now. Uh, GPT is actually quite good at it. But here I'm on, on this plane with two of the most sophisticated language models. Um, GPT does 165 billion calculations for every word it produces for you so while I'm flying. Uh, and then I get sort of a message from our marketing team. They need this image for another meetup that's coming up in Austin. So I'm using Midjourney to try and work through all that. And still talking to my wife sitting next to me and texting my friend uh, about wine that uh, he just got in at the grocery store. Like, and I talk to him a lot. Identify. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a role of a designer. Like this is sort of a the tool set that's emerging in front of us, and it's pretty damn wild to me. Like I haven't experienced this shift. Like I said, we've been working in AI for over a decade now, and all of it's been sort of that just out of arm's uh, reach for me personally, you know, working with developers and trying to democratize, allow uh, developers to sort of work with all of that. And now it's sort of thrust into my lap and my capabilities, and it's you know, quite exciting. So just two quick disclaimers that I, I there's no there there, uh, and I will be probably in this talk actually misrepresent how we talk about interacting. So I may say like, oh, I used Midjourney and I asked it to make uh, fast food objects into superheroes or superheroes into hamburgers. But you don't ask it and it doesn't reply. Like I input a query into the Midjourney tool and it returned an image to me. Like that's the factual way. Uh, so the, especially like GPT, the conversational nature of it, we sort of thrust sort of uh, agency to it, it's not correct. And the reason why I make this point is that there is a lot of actual debate that we need to have about this, and that's not one of them. So like getting that sort of out of the way and not having these sort of uh, New York Times like, it's trying to get me to break up with my wife, sort of scandal stories, <laughs> like, it's just unnecessary noise and distracts from the real conversations we need to be having. Uh, and the second, this is pulled from, uh, so last time Mark spoke quite publicly about this, uh, GCT4 was actually released while he was giving his talk at South by. So, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> if we say we're envisioning something that's true by the end of this talk, well, I mean, we're just, we're just that good, I guess. Uh, so this is how I approach something new. Uh, part of it's my nervous energy when I don't understand something, or if I have to explain something to someone and I don't know it well enough that I can speak simply on it, I get a lot of anxiety. So this tooling started, it was about a year ago. I was at Amsterdam and, you know, GPT-2 had been out since 2019. So the early uh, stable diffusion stuff it was just starting to cross the threshold of comical to, oh, this is actually kind of interesting and useful. So I take the approach, we take the approach. I mean, sort of the mantra of Argo is think by making, is just start trying stuff. Uh, sort of move past the ignorance of it and sort of understand it to have uh, more sort of lively debate and use of it. Uh, so as Mark said, we just took a project that was in flight and said, Let's just throw everything at this project at it and, and uh, see what sort of comes at it. And, you know, the obvious one is imagery. We tell a lot of stories. Uh, we produce a lot of decks and narratives. Uh, mm -hmm. Scrolling around for stock photography is 
the pastime of a lot of designers trying to find the right image in the right context sometimes. <laughs> now you just sort of sit down and, and imagine it. Like, this is all, I mean, this is just gorgeous about this stuff. Like, you could get into the whole job side of it later, but like, this would take hours and hours of certain, very certain skilled people to do this. Uh, I see it as sort of my ability to curate or arrive at ideas that I maybe sort of wouldn't have been able to. Uh, it starts sort of very primitively. You're like, oh, let's try this. I wanted red orange color, and it was like, oh, what do you want? Oranges. Let's go. I'll give you a bunch of oranges. Here. <laughs> so they're like, no, no fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I meant the color, like <laughs> red and orange. Uh, and you start trying things like you're sort of throwing at terms and seeing how it sort of morphs with you, and you're like, oh, I like this sort of lava look to it. Like, I wasn't thinking about that. So then you're like, I want more of that. Lava, fire, and you're like, oh, that's, that is too much. That's disastrous for this client. Like, not, not going to like that, but it's still cool. So you sort of pull back, and you're like, well, let's try, like, time travel, anti-gravity, vortex, like, sort of throwing words at it. And you're like, well, that's, that is really, that's definitely, uh, I wasn't sort of heading in this direction, but I like sort of where we're going. And then try all sorts of other things, wires and batteries and connectors and deconstructed and uh, sort of forces you to really think about the vernacular of what you're sort of trying to imagine here. And yeah, it's sort of just to end up with these sort of great uh, cover slides, uh, insets, uh, wow. placeholder, everything, sort of all sorts of uses for sort of that. And then you're like, well, you know, hands are obviously the, the thing that everyone makes fun of. It keeps getting better at it, but let's just try anyway. Get, getting into some lifestyle, there's some scary hands in there, there's some basketball <laughs> hands in there. Um, it's still fun, the sort of futuristic, you know, the sort of looking at performance tuning and such the cars. So then everyone will try UI. Um, you know, there's a lot of just garbage in there too, but then you start having these moments of like, oh, that's cool. Like, it's not usable in any way, but as a designer, I can sort of extrapolate and sort of pull it apart and, and, and start building some of maybe a, a design system in my mind that you know, maybe I wouldn't have sort of thought of or had the purview to, to do, you know, some sort of other ways of looking at that. And then it was a code project, so we're like, well, let's throw some logos at it. Like, let's try some logo design or palette design, colors, and uh, Generation is like a commodity here. I mean, you can make hundreds of these, and if 0.01% if of them is good or even a little good to nudge you in a direction, like it's it's useful to me to be able to go wide and 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 fast and furious, and then sort of curate your way down. Uh, even sort of ending up on, you know, it's a pretty sexy little logo. Well, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, at the moment, I would still have to sort of deconstruct that into my in Figma and create the vectors for it all. So those bridges don't quite exist yet. So then I was like, all right, well, images, that makes sense. Let's try text. You know, there's a lot of things in our world that are text. So you get some project code names. So I was like, let's, let's start with some code names. Uh, let's take Jason and the Argonauts. That's sort of Argo's heritage. Uh, let's combine that with sort of next generation uh, car, computer computing and performance. That's the first column. And then you're like, well, all right, let's just do names that only have two or three syllables. So it sort of rolls off the tongue better. And then lastly, I'm like, let's just do two syllables. It was adding project to the front. Let's drop project off. Let's make it more concise. Let's make it more abstract. And let's make it easy to pronounce in Korean. That's the final column. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't know until you sort of ask it, and, and uh, you're still sort of overseeing what's coming out of it because it's a probability machine, not a solution machine. So nothing coming out of it should be assumed as factual. It's just not how it's wired. It's not how it works. Uh, so we took. Um, we do a lot of stakeholder interviews, especially early on in the process. We interview a lot of people involved in the product, either people that use it or people that, that uh, are sort of um, steering the project. We need a lot of text. Uh, we've always had sort of 
more historically like an otter, and you get these sort of dumps of text, and they sort of live there in the archives, and you visit them sometimes, and you know, maybe you'll try to go back and find a quote in there, but uh, and it's starting to do some summary and stuff like that. But now with like with GTP, you just sort of throw it in there and tell it to summarize it, uh, and then you're like, well, summarize it more, make it an executive summary, or you know, let's make this a punchy headline, but you know, still executive friendly. Uh, let's just take all of everything this interview he had and let's summarize his pain points. You know, pull those out of there. Or what about product opportunities? So, like, what I we started to find is that you need to start trust coming at the data and re-slicing it from every sort of angle possible, because. If you think of it as a probability machine, if you come at it generically, it's sort of going to give you the most generic answers. So the more context you continue to provide at home, and as you take different angles with it, you sort of uncover things that are interesting. So none of these will go right to press, but you sort of piece and pull things that are like, that have resonance with you and your team. Uh, then it's like, well, let's just give me a UI framework out of that, or Make that a product roadmap. Sure, okay. Uh, here's your Q1 through 4 breakdown. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, make that a Gantt chart. Uh, you're like, well, it's text only, but it still finds a way to sort of make a Gantt chart out for you. Uh, add some granularity to that because it's sort of generic. Uh, PRD, you know, it just breaks down into a product requirements document. Uh, and it sort of had all the sort of probability of what those sections are going to be, so product name and audience and product overview key features. Even if 80% of this is, is, is interesting, 70%, hell, 50% of this is interesting. That's saved our team hours of sort of starting with a blank document, starting with a massive data and sort of that sort of monumental lift of just getting some momentum, like, I mean, hell, 20%. Like it's, it's more than what you started with, and it gives you that sort of no longer blank starting point and some momentum behind where you might want to go. So just kept going with that, right? Right. This is user flows. What are the features you're sort of seeing out of this conversation? Well, if we have those features, what screens should show up? Give me the IA of one of those screens. Hell, let's start writing the code for it. You know, how, what are the frameworks you, you suggest doing this? Break this down into the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, write the JSON for the Figma button that I need for this. Um, this, I thought, was more interesting. Where I'm like, I need data to fill some of these charts out. So give me 280 values. This is a car riding around a racetrack, and we're pulling data off an ECU. And I want the utilization of the ECU, and I want a regular dip in the speed. It's going to last for 11 values. Sure, here's your time, here's your acceleration, and here's your G-force. Uh, it's way better than sort of drawing some squiggly lines on the chart dashboard that we've all done way too many times. Like, it's pretty interesting. Uh, generate a color palette. This story actually goes a lot deeper. Just showing a color palette, you know, I was like, make a color palette. I want it to work for charting on a dark mode. Uh, continued this story with, okay, um, I need six colors to be on a screen at a time. I want consideration for color blindness. Uh, Relook at all of these. Give me all the accessibility values and uh, how, uh, how are the contrast values and such for all the different color blindness breakdowns and just get that out of the system. Uh, and it'll say, well, this, this color and this color are just not meeting it. Here's some suggested alternatives. Uh, you put those in and retry it. You go back and forth a little bit and you sort of end a much more accessible palette for charting. Like, it's things we want to do as designers and we just don't have time. And this allows you to sort of go broader and do more on that. Uh, the more that I could do with accessibility and have time to do it, that's sort of fantastic for me to know. And then having a little fun with it. All right, well, it's a new product. Let's write some fun headlines for the product launch. Let's make an email pitch to the investors. Let's go ahead and outline a pitch deck for this. Uh, we need an outline for a 90-second product demo sizzle reel. Uh, loser loves this one. This is not whole. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Introduction, 10 seconds. Breaks down what screens. You're going to need a tagline here. You can tell it to sort of 
provide examples for all this as well. I mean, testimonials, call to action, closing, the whole sort of breakdown. Again, this is stuff that it just sometimes the first 20 or 30% of it is just grind work because you just have to get the momentum going and it sort of provides that accelerant for you. And the hell, just write this as a poem. <laughs> um, personality quiz. Um, welcome to the performance tooling personality quiz. Here's 10 questions. What kind of high performance vehicle do you own? Oh uh, how important is user friendly? You could probably do, tell it, like, no, make this a, a Disney princess personality quiz. It, it would do its Got best it. to figure that out. Like, um, brainstorm some bumper stickers. Uh, the point of the silliness is, like, if you think of the way these models have worked, they're, they're not a search engine. They have created a relational data set of the human language uh, in many languages, actually, sort of over-index on English, but these models can work in, I think, 140 languages, a substantial amount of languages. Uh, the surprising thing to academ academia is how probabilistic the human language is that's why they work so well. Uh, we like to think we're super special and how we speak and such. Mathematically, it turns out we're not. Um, the probability of how we say things based on the context in which we say them, it turns out it seems to be pretty predictable. Uh, take that for how you want to take that. So in conclusion here, what's next for at least the next 15 minutes? <laughs> Tools we're consistently using. Uh, a lot of image generation through mid-journey, uh, a lot of text and code generation in GPT-4. Uh, Whisper is a, a, a transcription engine again through OpenAI. Topaz Labs, there's free alternatives to that, but it does such great upscaling. Uh, I just went, at, went ahead and paid for it because it just works well. And poor Adobe did make their, uh, yeah, poor Adobe did make the list with their neural filters. <laughs> there's some good stuff in there, but they are still trying to play catch up in this. And then there's sort of this endless list of tools that we keep trying. Uh, one thing to note, it's good to understand like the undercurrent. There seems to be thousands of tools. There's a lot of opportunistic <laughs> sort of people. There's only a handful of model providers or holders of the models here. So sort of understanding the provenance of what's driving a lot of these, sort of, especially if you want to get into the consideration of you know, where some of the stuff was sourced, it's good to understand. Uh, there's not millions of models. There's not as many models as there's tools. Uh, there is a, quite a distinction there, and it is important. And then concluding here, uh, where we're looking to play next, we're sort of three buckets here. The biggest of what, like, the type of artifact that can be generated is continuing to broaden. The video is being sort of pushed hard into 3D and 3D models is interesting. Vector continues to be interesting, even type. Uh, multimodal, where you can assemble, assemble text and imagery, maybe a presentation like Tomei allowed you to do, like all cool stuff to try and look at. How we actually generate this, there's a lot of interesting work to be done. Right now, it's just a chat interface for a lot of these or a Discord interface, um, and sometimes it's misleading. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of white paper work happening on different ways to approach this. And then the beyond, like there's, you know, this is, this is a moment tomorrow will be different. Um, there's, AI has these fits and starts where the sort of our desire to progress and compute the new power of computation in data is sort of a line every few decades and then smaller and smaller. We should add that moment again where sort of very basic neural network algorithms where they shit to the computation and data that sort of produced all these emergent capabilities that sort of no one really had that prediction that we're coming. So uh, it's, it's going to be a wave here for a little bit. So I am last little all. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. So we've arrived at the conversational portion of the evening. So please just make sure to raise your hand if you have some 
questions and you want us to pursue a different line of you know conversation, please just wave and I'll I'll try and catch you. Um, <laughs> I'm the one in the middle. Um, so probably the question everybody's asking is like, why AI? Why right now? Right? I mean, on some level, building on what Matt has said, we've had this in our society in a lot of different places. Like as as Mark was saying you know, industrialized, meaning that it's probably in the background, it's informing a lot of the technology that we already have out there. So why, in this moment, should we care about the AI? What's, what's the story there? Why now? Let's take a shot at this. Why now? I mean, you could get very little about it. I think the image generation technologies, uh, stable diffusion, as an example, and Dolly just got good enough that it raised, it raised awareness. And this is only months ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but right on the tail of that, GPT got good enough. I think that's where it, it got really interesting. It had been around for a while in various incarnations, but wasn't good enough to raise our attention. So we have that to notice. But I think there's something bigger going on that we should bring into the conversation, is that our general computing model using phones with downloaded apps, apps that are trying to capture ever more finite, what we say at Argo's closing small gaps. They're trying to close ever smaller gaps in our lives and available productivity uh, openings, you know, ever reduced green fields of opportunity. Uh, that is coming up to a real friction point. Right? There's just not a lot left. I mean, as a creative mind, it's always terrible and feels frightful to say there's not a lot left, but it's getting harder. Let's at least agree on that. Um, and then we had had this for the longest time, and if we are guilty of participating, uh, this sensation that another modality of computing was just on the horizon. Uh, at first, it was, you know, kind of a mixed reality experience. Magic Leap was our customer for many years, uh, and we spent an immense amount of effort trying to bring the computer out of the sort of private experience where you're... I always like to pose this argument. Computing is largely about a way of removing yourself from the world and immersing yourself in this sort of alternate engagement. And we've gotten really good at this sort of back and forth argument, but we still crash cars and run into poles and ignore uh, our friend sitting next to us in trying to navigate that. And the mixed reality argument was, can we bring those together? Can we bring computing further into the world so it can be uh, more compatible with us in life, but also if you can bring it into a conversant state uh, of what's going on, then you can experience entirely new things. And then kind of on the tail of that was the metaverse, which I feel like was an incredibly ill-timed uh, <laughs> and ill-conceived idea because it was ever further removal from our involvement. It was, really, I, I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> our next session will be just, just I don't want to digress <laughs> But it was, the point being is this sort of next state of computing uh, was on a lot of us in the industries uh, on our minds. And then this thing hit. And a couple of things dawned on us. It's like, well, first of all, it gave form to this sort of formless aspect of the value of computing that we had been intuiting but didn't have an excuse for. And we kept trying to inject that into this other model, this uh, you know, mixed reality model. But the truth is just the ability to carry out an argument with the computer in a much more sort of fluid way, that was what we were looking for. And this poked at that. You know, it's, we're not there yet, but it, it surfaced and, oh, crap, this could really happen. And I don't think anyone, even the AI researchers, I mean, we're just talking about this particular paper that rolled up a lot of the state of the art uh, from a bunch of scientists put this out, and they didn't expect this to happen either. So why now is, I think, the fact of this collision and just uh, 
the essential, essential randomness of that compute capability hitting that critical mass. Uh, I do think, so I'm just mm -hmm. going to jump to another Go ahead. point <laughs> and try and shut up, uh, that this current model is a sort of temporary expression, this needing to rely on a purely textual conversation and largely a long form textual conversation. Matthew showed in some of his queries the emerging art form of compressing that, but largely it still requires a lot of words. And more than anything, it's contextless. It really doesn't know you from Adam. It doesn't, it can follow your conversation. What is it, 30 deep? It's, yeah, it's about yeah. 30,000 tokens, which are some less amount of words. Um, but it, it doesn't live with you, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't realize that you have routinely been pursuing this subject matter or this, this right. perspective. Um, it doesn't know you're outside. It doesn't know you're 10 years old or mm -hmm. 70 years old, uh, male, female, etc. And those dispositions drive most of how um, a lot of other knowledge systems, you can go see your doctor. And that's incredibly important. Uh, and uh, those sort of things are not part of this initial model. So I, one of the things is we imagine the usefulness of this. I think we have to get past this immediate moment, just kind of understand you're seeing the rawest possible expression. And so just to eject into this conversation and maybe open it up a little bit here is, I want you to imagine quickly shifting, kind of Matthew into it there earlier, that the next phase of this is injecting context that can be low forms of context, like time, day, place, but it can be really high forms of context. Um, like this person is walking north on a street. Uh, they are always there, or this is the first time they've been there. Uh, this person is, of course, all of their particular biometrics, their particular background information, simple stuff, nay, nay, you just take. Um, and uh, even maybe more context, which is that sort of deep history. What have I been asking about? What have I, and, and, what am I, and the profiling that might suggest what I might want to try and be solved. And the models of that, if you, look at, if, you, if you look at the data systems behind things like music selection and movie selection, those models, the simple metrics I described there, whenever you go to pick a movie or listen to a song, those are all matched against everyone else within essentially a reductive comparison of you versus others. None of that's at play. That's, that basic approach will radically advance the ability for those systems to not just help write a poem about something that you have to fully kind of uh, instruct, but to give you highly specific information in the moment. And I always think about computing's true advances are the further it gets towards the moment, right? Rather than having to bring the sort of preloaded or these broad tool sets in for you to have to narrow those moments. Um, and to bring them for you, you particular. That is by itself radical shift, even on top of what we're talking about is so true, but quite right. Uh, you know, and then you can add to that just simply preloading those things or writing basic software on top of that that says, well, whenever you find these collisions of, of out, outside metrics, go ahead and run that query for the person. In other words, when they arrive home, run a query against a set of contexts and offer up something. We tried that stuff, um, by the way, years ago with just brute force computing, you know, win code and do X, Y, and Z. And most people were like, oh God, the computer's annoying me. It, it's, you know, Clippy was the first sort of oh, <laughs> no. innovation. Right? We all know how that worked. But when you look at the intelligence, uh, Intelligence is the wrong word, but it's our humanizing this. And um, when you look at the fidelity of that type of interaction that Matthew showed you against those sort of basic context engines, you can imagine really different quality to the experience. And that's 
where we imagine this is going. Like we can take one core leap and imagine the applications we have today that are part of the sort of mass industrialization of you know, value into little snippets that are chasing ever and ever more finite purposes are in question. Why do we need to download 20 apps or 50 apps where, where we preloaded aspects of our life? Why wouldn't those be sort of generated in the moment? In other words, ephemeral software. Or in a lot of ways, it's also quantum software. It's, it's quantum and using that to abuse that word a little bit. It just happens in the moment and doesn't happen the same way again. Uh, because it's ephemeral, I don't particularly care. I'm going to use it, and it's going to go away, uh, and I'll generate it again when I need it. Uh, that is, you could kind of roll that up as the idea of real-time internet. We talk about real-time in all kinds of ways. And really, what when people say real-time now, they just mean right away or soon. But imagine real-time as in it didn't exist, wasn't stored, it wasn't set off to the site. It did not exist until you needed it, and then it went away. Yeah. So we have covered, a lot. We covered the galaxy. <laughs> we cover the galaxy. Yeah, you know, and so we're gonna bring we're gonna bring it back down to like some smaller things to just try and bring together some of the things that Matt talked about when he's talking about, you know, sort of interfacing with these systems and the idea that there is some utility that can be drawn out of this, but it does it's about rel it's about relative relationship, right? It's about how you use it utilizing these tools to get that extra twenty percent, that that extra thirty percent that you don't have to do as a person. And you're into the spectrum out in space and coming in a little bit, <laughs> a little bit from there. Um, you know, there's a level of futurism that actually has to happen in your point of view here because you just said context. And humans are about context. We're all about context. We understand and inter interact with each other differently based on context. So how do, how do people in business, how do we as designers, how do we sort of reorient our brains to understand how to take in this moment and ride this moment and start to build this awareness of these new behaviors. Let's bring an example to the table. So, I don't know, I joined Frog Design uh, in 1994, and I worked there for 20 years, and then I, I left and founded Argo. But, and the Frog, one of the first projects um, that was going on next to me as I was working on stereo system interface was a toaster. <laughs> we made a, a fancy new toaster. And it's just, I've always found that emblematic of the sort of traditional industrial creative process is that there needed to be a new toaster that year. It wasn't an invention so much. It's just making a cool or new thing. And it, in the design, it was having to, be having to be created for the sort of largest possible cohort, largest possible consuming audience. Um, and yet here we're talking about software that might not uh, work that way, right? Yet the whole business world is created around. We're at the time right now working for a company called Builder, Builder.ai. Go look them up. And they have a piece of software we're helping them go through different generations of and it's out now, the first version of it, that takes your idea, you can, you can verbalize this to it in an interview. You can just say, I wanna make an app um, for, to help me plan ski vacations. That, that's, I wanna make that app for people. And Builder, the system will listen to all of that and discern the things you said, you know, a lot of uh, speech to text, and then it has an AI model. It's not a large language model, but it's, you know, it, this is pointing towards the future. And it will break that down into a set of application features. You know, some of the obvious things like login and uh, selection tools, for example, like lodging, um, you know, and it, it realizes, well, a ski vacation would include things like renting equipment, so it, it, it provides lists for that. and it, it knows how, that it needs a sequence of selection moments. It literally will help you design an app. You're not the designer per se and dragging templates onto the screen. You're talking to it uh, and answering questions it's asking in a textual form. And from there you get a kind of 80, 
click through of the app that you've asked for and you say send and it goes off to a bunch of engineers that will then put that together and sell you back the app. I mean, you'll spend about 15 grand instead of 500 grand to make this. Thing. This is working now. Um, the, it involves some humans checking, like, did this thing come up with some crazy <laughs> <shot guess>? <laughs> responses to your idea? Uh, it involves programmers writing the code but throughout this process, this company, and they've talked about this, they're actually in the Wall Street Journal recently, I think, uh, I forget, anyway, some major press around, eventually that programming can be done through the models, unless you really diverge from norms. You don't need to send that off to a bunch of programmers. So you might be able to have that that afternoon, or you might be able to have that at the end of your conversation, the finished app. But today, there's still an app store. So let's think of the generation after that. You might just run that app after asking for it. Now, you're still in this sort of constructive idea of building an app, a kind of, a you know, apps of binaries. Or think of them as a finished product, like a toaster. Well, the reason I use the toaster example, still, you're still kind of an industrial mindset, making a thing. But hey, that's just kind of a leap. Back to your question, this is kind of this crazy, tiny little leap to what I described earlier that sounded like a mission to Mars. You know, ephemeral apps, quantum apps. So we are working on something that is not terribly distant from that. And so when you see the generative ability of write me a poem in the prose of Shakespeare about my GPU, you realize these two things collide not too far from here. Mm -hmm. And for everyone in business who are solving discrete business problems by thinking of mass consuming constituencies, or mass constituencies that own the problem or know the problem, and you realize you're trying to create a fixed solution for them, uh, you realize how that is going to radically change. So all of us will be affected by it. If you make ads, and we, we played around with the model ad. Uh, we don't do advertising, so it was just play. <laughs> uh, where we had, we generated a series of images of people wearing shoes. It was the same pair of shoes, but it was a whole bunch of different people in different environments. I realized, like, is there any reason anyone would ever see the same ad anymore? Maybe it's sort of the same foundational creative concept because we intentionally canonized that part but everything else about it might be just ephemeral. I see it and then it's gone. It was generated, in fact, it wasn't stored. It's not like we stored a thousand pictures. We just generated when the ad needed to deploy, which happens on other dimensions now, on technical dimensions. I might do that on the content and as well. So that, that point about, you know, it's here and it's gone, it's instantiated in the way that I've called it, it's, it's, it's nothing, it's a frame, it's, 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 it's ephemeral. Oh my God. It's it's ephemeral. ephemeral. <laughs> 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 I'm glad that you have the same problem. My, my son, I'm not going to do it. Speakers have no, fun. Listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> ephemeral. Do you right. need a <laughs> <laughs> um, So when, when you think about that, you know, that is a, that's really radical because it starts to talk about sustainability in the context of business. It's kind of like, okay, so using that example. I used to worry about all of these different people and I'm spending all of this money and I had all of this spend which was going into all of these advertisers and all of these media companies and all of these people. And now I don't need any of them because, you know, I just say, hey, you, you know, swap out these shoes for, you know, and catch one over here and go oh, there, right there, and you know, over here. So how do you... Uh, the inevitable question, what about the job? <laughs> <laughs> because they don't want to know. Everybody wants South Park. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, but to put it into more context, right? It's not so much that the job should just evaporate because we're going to have a reactionary sort of yeah, role, press, right? So, I mean, but, but how do you navigate that? So taking this talk, you know, going out and starting to talk and really educate yourself. What are the things that you suggest everybody should go and do what, what to, to become more comfortable with the idea that we're going to be experimenting with the future. 
Well, if I'm going to just jump yeah, go ahead, please. <laughs> I'm sitting this way, Paul. Uh, my anecdote at the beginning, sort of trying to allude to that a little bit, and, and so comically on my LinkedIn, it says recovering pixel pusher. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my role is becoming an orchestrator. Like, these tools are allowing me to so go broader, and I, I may not be sort of needing to sort of finitely draw each pixel and all of this, but I become sort of the, the, the you know, the orchestrator of that. So you're sort of advertising example, like, uh, you know, may not be overseeing all these sort of photo shoots or a different type of photo shoot, uh, and you start to orchestrate the idea. Basically, you set it in motion computational this is design, uh, you sort of set the framework and then you allow it to just sort of go. Um, it's kind of interesting that like it's, uh, what becomes really, I think, sort of interesting is it allows you to arrive at things you wouldn't have imagined before. Like, I'm limited as a designer to what I've seen them and exposed to, I can recall and try to put down, like, uh, the diffusion model that generates images, I mean, theoretically, it's doing it pixel by pixel. It could generate every image possible and that's ever could be seen. Like, all possibilities exist in that window. You could arrive at some interest that's sort of uh, uh, everywhere all at once alternative universes mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, people with hot dog fingers, like, this yeah. is cool. I'm living the flaw of this world. But, <laughs> um, yeah, let it, let's live here. Let's play with this. So, I think it's where it expands our ability to be creative and to think. Uh, and you sort of have this, you know, sort of the industrial revolution, the printing press, you know, technology tends to eat the automation, uh, but allows us, at least hopefully, to move into a higher creative uh, ability and to tackle more complex things. That's the hope. Yeah, that's a really interesting yeah. nuance, really, you know. I think it will. We have a quick question. Oh, John. Mm -hmm. Can I also yeah, just please, something? Jump in. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, I think Matthew, what you just said at the end was actually super on point in terms of if you try new things out and really go deep in them, yep. you actually realize pretty quickly that one thing that's missing is intuition, creativity. But I just think that's not come up with stuff. Mm -hmm. right? It's like you have to it's come up with so it's not right, person. Correct. And, it, and, it, and I think, um, I mean, my, what I tell all these people is like, oh, you don't want to be out of jobs. You might will find a new career. And space is a great um, area to venture out if somebody wants to go with, on Mars with me. Um, but I think that that's, that's the important point about digital publishing, right? When this came into place, it's like people, yes, there were people probably finding new jobs in a different area and a different career, and that's okay. But most of the people adapted and found a new profession with it. That's why we have Photoshop and all these tools today. And I think that's the interesting part, right? It's like, it doesn't go without the human. And now we're coming in this human machine relationship discussion, and that will be really interesting. For it. Uh, secondly, on that thought of just the idea of kind of like, and like the democratization, and then also we can even go with the the tip my job uh, from the artist's perspective, I think we've heard that. How is it your thoughts are kind of the importance of the prompt engineering? I also look at it almost more of the artist and knowing the knowledge of what to say versus how to say, because yes, anybody can put in a prompt to a majority response, but to get, you know, let's just take your thinking cat image, right? You need to know David, you may need to know like what type of cats out there, you may need to know like you know, ambient occlusion style for different types of photography, of having a key light or backlight, like how, what are your thoughts are kind of incorporating the artist's knowledge versus, you know, just the democratization of like a simple prompt? There's a, uh, there's a second and third part to this talk, if it's a more sort of formal talk, you know, mm -hmm. and one of the slides that we hit on is that vocabulary is the new learning curve, mm -hmm. uh, because you're completely right, like, when we approach imagery specifically, uh, you get into, I don't know, I wonder what type of camera would have been used. What's the film type? Mm -hmm. Like, I have this sort of bizarre Instagram account, <laughs> chat party, and just indie sleaze. And you get into like, oh, it's 
would typically be a, a lithography 800 thermal film, and I could have an off camera flash, mm -hmm. and you know, even the journals like any sleaze of early 2000s, and oh, what's the fashion type? Like, you really get in deep at the vernacular of this to, to reconstruct the sort of, you know, people what hot dog thing world. Like, you, you, I find some fascinating sort of challenges as you go back or for the first time to learn all sorts of new words. And like we were at Amsterdam at the uh, Rijks Museum and there's, I've forgotten the name of it now, but it's this type of a uh, style where it's several layers of glass, painted glass. Oh, I just saw this list. I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the technique. It has a great name to it. Um, it's an art I hadn't sort of been exposed to, but so we left the art of the museum and I went to sort of adventure and sort of tried out that style with Jason and the Argonauts and lots of amazing images going out of there. But like that word is, it's in there, but it's sort of for you to sort of mm. lock that. You know, yeah, it's what I think also, as I said earlier, this is a current moment where that is the way to get a product. Um, it's starting with people like Adobe and mm. like it or not, and, but every other. Uh, application uh, developer out there will create other ways to engage those mm -hmm. fake and at the end of the day they're just generating a query mm -hmm. and you think of that as sort of the end destination of the current system mm -hmm. model um, and uh, there'll be interfaces that for example generate an image but still give me a three-dimensional room model uh, that I can adjust light yeah, and that's and that may be actually part of the conversation. You ask for a cat, show me a cat, yes, uh, and then give me a oh no, that's not the cat I want. Give me a skeletal model, like I'll show you. Not very. The system's not. <laughs> well, the it, system's not conversant. And I pick like an IK model if you if anyone's ever done three D. Yeah, uh, the system's not conversant in multiple input forms today, and it's not conversant in models human created models, not just its own, or um, other sort of abstractions that we readily work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and has, is, you know, as Matthew was talking about, there are kind of classified abstractions, like film types and things like that, but there are others that are just knowledge systems, core by, that you could narrow down to that wouldn't require you just type ever more precisely. It, and uh, this came, I should give the that this question came from like, I've been doing more work in like Cinema 4D and like 3D modeling work. And it's exactly. like, oh yeah, it's very it's simple. Alive. Like you want to create a ball, like, oh, it's very easy. But then it's also, you need to know like physics of it. If like, you want to know like power, like if you want to incorporate like a pyro, like you put a tag in, but then what about like heat, temperature, influence, smoke, density, you Gravity. know, and then maybe an occlusion, yeah, then what the lens is. And these are all these facets that are like, Again, mid journey is a basic, a very basic thing to make something basic, but then adding in all these layers and making something that is actually, you not useful, but something that is engaging to the point that you want it to be. That's its. There are you know, university challenge. research demonstrations of kind of what you're talking about. Oh, really? Today. Oh. Which are um, their image generation, but and so they exist on the kind of query mm -hmm. origin basis, but they exist with an interface model wrapped around it, a spatial model. So you can say, well, let me see the other side of it, for example. Mm -hmm. And they started with things like image extension. So you, mm -hmm. you know, start to show a painting. It's like, what else, what's the rest of the room look like? Uh, but they've got now where you're just, you can turn the object, you can mess up the lighting. And it's, it's very intentional, right? It's kind of fixated on that mm -hmm. convergence of the normal way we look at 3D modeling and this generative uh, process, but you can converge any number of things. You could converge a style editor, something that has style templating with the model, or we use all three of those dimensions. Those those dimensions will probably be the Photoshop palette mm -hmm. uh, of the next couple of years. Fast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, all these AI models are based on kind of like everything to manage dots at a certain point, right? Wow. Oh. And chat and tea, it's like it's up to 2021. Then, mm -hmm. so how do we, in, you know, I think I noticed that a lot of like the first AI generated images I saw were very nostalgic. 
um, to like, what if this director did this movie in the Hades? And, um, you know, of course it's been happening a lot. It's a lot of missing, you know, but like these are on the past. Um, as in, you know, if, if we're basing all our models on things that might have thought of at this point, how do we prevent um, just remixing, like, sitting right back to the <laughs> end? And how do we subsidize uh, new, like, new, new human generation if you know, we have a job? <laughs> let's, let's, take, let's take a step at that a couple ways. One is that's not necessarily correct. Okay. It's actually lie number eight. <laughs> <laughs> he came with receipts. <laughs> <laughs> in, in so I, I'll, I'll show you the citation. But basically, um, the human corpi, you know, the, the model itself is not has been demonstrated as not a, a barrier to it arriving at at other forms of knowledge. It's okay. been able to compose its own outcomes even though something didn't exist. And it's come, as Matthew said earlier, it's combinatorial, but that does amount to something that is in, in a conclusive state new. Right. Sure. right. Uh, the other is, way to look at it is humans always tend to value new. You know, that's why uh, when I was at Frog, we got hired to make yet another toaster. <laughs> so I think new gets um, gets commissioned, and so artists will pursue new, especially especially as the repeatable aspects get captured by computing. You might say we will cherish new. So I think that um, it's in the you know if we want to move the conversation towards the arts, it's an incredible opportunity. It'll force us to sort of look at ourselves. And, you know, I think we talked earlier about, like, what is the Mona Lisa to us? You know, as an artistic expression, it's highly reproducible. But as something we know about it, you know, the effort and the mis mystery and the, its resilience through history is, you know, a painting of note. It's like, it reinforces that, the human side of the story. <laughs> Because we could spit out a, a bazillion Mona Lisa's right now in a query. So I don't think that diminishes the actual Mona Lisa that actually elevates, which is an interesting moment we're in where we've got to kind of take note of that and figure out like how to build systems around that notion. What about the next Mona Lisa? And Are you going to make the next Mona Lisa? <laughs> I feel like that's a challenge. Is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know. Anyone else? Well, I have to, before we move on to Pedro's, my, my two cents about it is that it's exactly as you said, right? The, the solution is in the question. The question is, what will we do knowing that we don't have to do certain things? It's getting accustomed to the idea. There's certain things we don't have to do it. Right? I mean, I don't have to go and schlep up the mountain and go pick some coffee beans and then bring it back down and dry them and you see where I'm going with this. <laughs> you know, I don't have to do that. I can go to Starbucks and I get a cup of coffee. So part of this discussion is really asking ourselves and, you know, how do we create new networks? How do we create new skills? How do we get more precise with our language? How do we adopt new sort of behaviors and new ideas in, in the context? Going to come back to you, but we're going to go to Petros. Yeah. So, um, actually, I have a question. Says so many people are you know, using this obviously quite extensively. So you can create a lot of images and ideas quickly, right? So the ideas become a little less precious, so you don't mind moving on from that, right? So how do we, or I guess, how do you balance kind of keeping AI from becoming like the infinite sprawl of like ideas and no way, like so when is that open up? So are you actually saving time, or are you putting more time into? It's nice that it allows more direct time for exploration, but at the same time, like. And you resist that urge to keep pushing it to find perfect. So I love this question. Um, one, I have zero interest in being more productive. Be like, you agree? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being facetious here. That's really bold. I, I, I appreciate that. As a designer, now as opposed to three years ago, like, the amount of efficiencies and working in like Figma and all, like we are more productive than the man. Like there's this sort of no gain, I think, creatively to be more productive at this point. So uh, I feel like 
this allows me to explore more things in the sort of in the context of a project, so be a lot of time on the, the, the budget that's been allocated to this. Uh, the infinite scroll is very real. Uh, there is the do there's, there is the dopamine, uh, <laughs> like there is. Yeah. Uh, Jen, you will know that I come to bed. And have like two hours later, come to bed. One more. Still make it Go for it. No. Yeah. One more. So I just one more prompt. One more prompt. Yes. One more prompt. I'm so close. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's one more. Prompt. Because I mean, it is it is the slot machine a little now. Like, oh, what's the next thing that'll come out of there? Mm -hmm. And there's there's some good and bad with that. I think it's something we'll have to sort of. Uh, They'll get all. All new. Part of it is, is when it becomes more instantaneous, weirdly becomes less sort of dopamine. Uh, as press the anticipation. Yeah, it's a sort of anticipation. Like we haven't waited as designers for like a decade, you know, the rendering and all of this sort of, it's kind of nice again to wait a minute. You know? yeah. First time. Agree. <laughs> so we have, if not really, a you go, it's never day a question, it's more of a, Reflection and a comment, and you know, I've been obviously like with Petros, we, we design stuff, so I'm an industrial designer. Being an industrial, a woman industrial designer uh, in this country, I'm, I'm not from here. Um, it, it's super easy today, right? Like, there's so much wrong run, etc. So, things that I'd be you know, listening to is how low the proficiency rate of women in these tools is, and so I worry about the bias that comes with that, right? Like, have it, it, the results you get from that is only as good as it as what's in it, right? Like, what you get to pick from or the pool. But if there are, you know, significantly less women and women of color or women of underdeveloped countries contributing to these, then will these make our problems even worse, right? Like, what, how do we get around that? And I mean, of course, getting more women in, into the side and the workforce is, is one path, but like, I'm really like kind of scared of that, right? Because it happens in the medical field, and it happens in all sorts of fields. Still, so, yeah, that's that's scary to me. I mean, it's a, that's true for all tech. Like, it's so uh, you know, terrible as a uh, soap dispenser, and I met more dispenser for dark skin. Like, uh, that bias there is is it's I don't want to sort of brush it aside is sort of it's a humanity problem it's uh what's i think what could be interesting is some of the initial research is showing that these models so this one a lot to unpack here but they're not beholden to the it's like a, a gpt is not beholden to its initial trainings this gets to so you have a question too so like GPT or a large language model action creates an abstract understanding of the human language. It actually has no understanding of the training data that was built on. It's all being turned into numbers and all that. It's a relational database. So it's, it's a more abstract way and it's able to be steered uh, with the right governance um, sort of quite independently of what it's been trained on. So still being very effective and not sort of pull to maybe what some of the bias was in there initially. It's sort of a broad, I think what I would say is, this is, this moment with AI is a, it's a moment for humanity. Like all people need to be participating in this conversation. Like it, it's, it's sort of that, I think sort of monumental, like it. Yeah. So. Like collective thing going there. Yeah. And I, and I, and I would build on what Matt's saying. I use chat GPC and I try and break it. I am, I, that works. I, want to I, I was telling it some really, really rough stuff and I get to like try and like jump out of a list of real deep linguistic, you know, loopholes, right? And I do ask it very direct questions. We can talk later when I put it to chat GPT. But, you know, building on Matt's point, it's about adoption and it's about people using it because remember as a language model, the more people who use it and the more people who provide feedback, the more it understands that there are nuances to the relationships within its model. So it's not that it's taking people's initial bias. I mean, it will simply tell you, 
as uh, many of you have probably seen this, as an AI language model, I say, you know, so yeah. there's not, there's, again, you can't anthropomorphize it. It's not real. It's not like a person. It doesn't have emotions. It just has relationships. So the more people who provide the nuances between those relationships, the more of us that participate, the more nuanced it can be and the more smart it can be about understanding how those nuances might exist in a real life scenario. Right, right. right. So, so what I think about is this example from like Hermes or Rye, like he was, I think like trying to deserve for like for recruiting and he ended up being like super biased, you know, like oriented mm -hmm. to like a certain type of candidate. So yeah, I guess th that's where I'm going, right? Like it's, it's sort of like we have all to get on this, but like it, it's, it feels so massive and like haven't we even started, right? Like there's people that don't have access to it. So there's, uh, there's one that's sort of about the jumping and there's um, another bit, so there's a lot of interesting rules of this happening. And actually one bit sort of very counterintuitive is that let's say you want for a large language model to be less racist. So sometimes you would think, well, we need to make the training data less racist. And it's actually the opposite I'm starting to show is that if you expose it to more things that don't that, that aren't valued, I can name them and and steer away as as opposed to sort of trying to yeah. circumvent or whatever. Literally it's able to discern the biases of its questioner and the biases of the data and steer accordingly. And, and to that end it's like it's probably actually a lot easier to steer a language model to be less racist than a person like mm -hmm. you we hold on to that in our brains. If you have, you know, all sort of the bias and such that we have. We model have it's it. more of a, yeah, the model more is just a alignment. I think you steer away from. I think the two optimistic ways of breaking this, to opening up that question is, one is it normalizes access to create. So if you do that, more people can create and it's not, it, not biased on training and legacy position, right? He can generate anything I can generate that a 10 year old can generate. He just moves up and down the ladder, skill and intent, and it's measurable by the product at that point. The second is it creates a world where novel is more interesting. Novel shouldn't be the measure of all things, but novel tends to be a force for taking a minority style, you know, it could be minority created style or just a new style that there's fewer examples of and magnifying that, right? Etsy is a medium, you know, an exchange medium where tend to emphasize the novel, right? And it's et Etsy as a platform for created objects tends to uh, magnify that and it's open to all. So. In a lot of ways, I hope to see sort of an Etsyification of what right now is a very industrialized world. Mm -hmm. If everything can be created all the time, that sort of mass market uh, dependency we have probably does break down into a far more mass personalized set of experiences. And, uh, and that tends to glorify and magnify those unique experiences and go back to the humanistic argument is someone who has the most unique kind of original story and original sensibilities and intents tends to drive the system towards that, right? They respond to that mm -hmm. from their own personal experience. And that becomes something uh, new for the world to consume. That's, that to me is a good thing. There are fewer barriers. People in a sort of corporate instance are like, no, 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 we want the norm. We want to sell the next norm. There are fewer of those people in that chain. Right? Etsy is not, as a great, great example, is not guarded by uh, tastemakers. Mm -hmm. I sell what you want. Mm -hmm. So we have, I know that we have my friend back here, and then we'll go to Bang in the Front. Um, if you have any thoughts, we're going to wrap up because we're uh, right at time. So. Oh. Uh, that's it. Yeah, didn't uh, we've been talking a lot about generative, uh, which is, I don't want to say low risk, but it's, it's a different aspect to it. There's another side too, which I think is the 
kind of questioning like the query based AI, which is its own aspect. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into that, which is how do you create trust with it? And you actually, this is the first thing you, one of the first slides you brought up, which was it doesn't have rational critical thinking. It's not going from point A to point B and then doing that thought. It's just there. So without that base relationship, which is how a lot of, I imagine, at least for me, how I imagine a lot of people create trust is I can ask and say, how did you get to that idea? You want, you'd have this rational critical thought. If you, without that, how do you create trust with an AI system? So we're, in the early days, and we're just depending on LLMs, mm -hmm. large language models for our one big old box to ask yeah. everything. Um, the next wave will be these, um, what are called SEMs, or basically, uh, God, I keep forgetting the term when we look down here. Scarce. Scarce, that's the part of the scarce expert models. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, the, the core phi of people who deserve to be asked. Like the Medical Association for health-related questions or Disney related to Disney's content. Don't ask a general system, ask them. And that provides a new home for brands because in a lot of ways, brands will lose out initially. A lot of brands are gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. The doors we have to get to to just get basic facility to use a function. Um, that you know they are wrappers for a lot of functionality in the software world. But imagine now we have one thing we can ask Siri or Google, whatever it ends up being, or the handful of them end up being. There probably will not be very many. But we ask it, and it, through that, of maybe established trust, or we ask specifically, ask, go ahead and ask uh, Disney this question. Um, they will build their brands around I assume, around the sort of trusted core by, and that will give us an, an arena to trust what it's saying back. And then the, the need as a business to reinforce whether or not they're trustworthy. Uh, on top of that, technically, we still don't have the ability to look into these systems very well. Provenance is a big problem with LLMs. Mm -hmm. Provenance is a, a factor in um, older, the, you say colder that the AI we've been working with basically just probabilistic AI, um, it just graph based um, systems are it, it is a really interesting uh, part of that. In fact, it was the first area we designed interfaces for mm -hmm. that they would have these insight generators that would make it basically pulling insights out of you know, large data streams, mm -hmm. recurring phenomena based on probabilities. And we would then graphically show the provenance of that insight, which is basically turning the graph into something human readable. Yeah. And that was a trust engine. I'm sorry for trying to take a technical thing. And the sort of basic trust engine is you could crack open what it was saying. Go, yeah. why did you say that? And that, so we need to get better interfaces that allow you to uncork, you know, look at them unfold what it's telling you. And I think that's my, that was kind of the big question is the why, because even like you said before, you even, in, even yeah. in this, even in like the scarce language models, which is what I've been doing a lot of the legal bases, you're still going to be probed with the same question where even from there, they're, they're actually going to be more critical to ask why. Yep. Less so than in even the large language models. So in those cases, you still, you're still stuck with the same problem. Yeah, and that's that's a level of software development we just haven't gotten to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. this is a 1920s era automobile. <laughs> We're all running around with really, really bad brakes. If you've ever driven one of those, no um, it's, it's a riot. It, there, death's galore back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what I guess uh, what I'm curious <laughs> of. <is>. Seriously. <laughs> But well, that's what I'm curious about this. How do you get from 1920s, I guess, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is actually a very good point to do a historical study of how did people... A few notable accidents, them. general public ashing, demanding it, and the self-motivation to be able to move that technology further into the mainstream. I mean, it's a big question. You can't demand, 
you have to imagine this technology being, uh, say something with the most assuredness, even though it sounds insane, I'm gonna say it. Every aspect of your life, just about every tiny little moment to even folding the laundry will be potentially assistable yeah. by this technology. There is no reason it can't help you pick out of the, out of a pile of laundry whose shirts and whose underwear that is. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you choose to use that kind of functionality at that moment in time, and whether you bought the interface that make, allows you to do it hands-free, is up to you. But the functionality will be available and yeah. for you to just say, help me with this. So I think that crazy tiny little moment, just to say it's gonna saturate that far. Yeah. But for it to saturate that far, the industry has to do these things. Mm -hmm. Just backing up to your question, I think those models of interface expressions, you know, provenance mm -hmm. uh, and the individual corpi that are trustable, mm -hmm. those things will have to emerge. Thank and just see like, uh, one little time doing it. So that, I guess something changes every day. So like, I think the last week, Amazon at least their code was for, uh, and it'll actually, as you're coding, it's suggesting code. Okay, Mm -hmm. Say, oh, this bit actually looks like, or probably is from this open source or this commercial. Uh, and here's how you pull in the license or get the right license. Like, it's already unpacking the provenance of code. Uh, so if it suggests a chunk of co a code, part of that is from an open source. It'll note that, tell you the right licensing and such to do. Like. That unfolding is, so like, ask again next week and it might be more clear, and then ask again in six months. You know. uh, it's, it's inevitable sort of to unpack these things. I mean, even DARPA, DARPA had sort of 15 year roadmap of unpacking the black boxes and sort of have come back and sort of refactoring how they want to approach sort of the, uh, uh, the transparency of how these models work. And you were saying like laws, governance, insurance, Mm -hmm. Like all this stuff switched to uh, build up on it and, and uh, starts to mature. I mean, this is like DOS days right now. <coughs> terminals. Uh, yes. And I can go in there and I can say, delete my hard drive. And it will say, great. Which do you the founder of that first <laughs> customer I described, but, you know, our very first customer, uh, Cognitive Scale, the guy who founded that, Manoj, like saying I used to run high beams Watson team. He has now just started a company and his entire job is to maintain a trust to framework around running AI. So oh, really? His system basically pulls a re constant report around its trustworthiness, its model drift, all of the sort of factors that allow the owners of that system a way of monitoring and safeguarding uh, its out outputs. Interesting. And there's a, there's a whole other talk about <laughs> what that entails, but it's basically how do you lift the lid on the black I'm excited for that one. So I know we, we had one more question. I mean, like, oh, we, we've got some time. You know, I, I know we're right at time. Thanks so much for everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Matt, for such an interesting time.